Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Rhode Island Small Business Coalition Live Forum. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, David Dedekian, a small business owner here in Rhode Island. I own Eat, Drink, Rhode Island. And uh, we're sorry we, we couldn't join you a couple of weeks ago. We had uh, an unfortunate scheduling problem, but we're very excited to be back this this uh, this time with Secretary of State Nor Nelly Gorbea. Uh, it's fantastic to have Madam Secretary with us here. Please welcome her to our show. Hey, David. It's great to be here with you. Thank you uh, for having me on. Uh, our pleasure. I'm glad you uh, glad you got the time, Madam Secretary. Uh, any sort of opening remarks or anything you'd like to make re regarding small business before we jump in? Sure. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here because I fervently believe and have worked because um, on, on small business issues, because small businesses are the backbone of our economy. And in times like this, where we're, we're coming post pandemic, it's it's even more important that government be there to help our small business owners. Uh, during my seven and a half years of Secretary of State, you know, I've really worked hard to eliminate barriers so, so that people who are interested in starting businesses are wanting to grow their business uh, can do so. And, and I've done it by changing the way government works out of the Department of State. You know, I, I like to have people think of my office as an ally, a supporter, a cheerleader, not an obstacle. And I think that that's, that makes a difference in people's lives. Absolutely. And I, and I think it has been, uh, you know, certainly, as you said, seven and a half years, I've seen the change. Um, let, let, I'm going to remind our, our, our viewers, uh, just so they know, and if you're out there viewing this live on Facebook, if you have questions for the secretary, please put them into the uh, chat and we'll add those uh, later. But I wanted to remind, um, so uh, out there, you've certainly used this website and you've certainly seen the improvements in this website over the last few years. Uh, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, new business formations, ongoing uh, registrations and things of that nature. So, so that's why... Um, you know, small business and the Secretary of State's office really go hand in hand in, in so many ways. And I just want to make sure uh, people out there rem remember that and, and, and realize. And if you are a, a corporation in Rhode Island, hopefully you filed your annual report uh, two weeks ago now. What is it? Today's the 17th. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. by the first. And, and, you know, again, that was uh, another part where we, you know, we worked hard. You know, a lot of the challenges that small businesses face are because things are outdated in the law. So right. that was a perfect example. Uh, we had a law that basically said that you had to file your corporations on X date, uh, your LLCs filed on a separate date, and nonprofits would file on, on another date, three different dates. Why? Right. Because way back when, when all of this was written up, you know, that we were doing paper processes. And, and so we would get buckets, buckets of annual reports in each of these categories. And in order to process them in an orderly fashion, you had to split it up into three. Now, fast forward, and now we've made it easier for people to use the online system. And suddenly you see 80% of your filings are now done online. And, you know, the mail is very, you know, manageable. So, but you can't just like in, in, when you're in business, you can just say, well, I'm going to change that process. No, it was written in the law. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to start next year uh, having only one date. To, to maximize on this. So, so we, I had to go to the legislature and say, we need to change the law. And then you get a lot of questions as to why you need to change the law. And, you know, it, so it's, it's, it's a process to do these things in government. Uh, but the, but, but the great news is, is that we were able to pass the law. We were able to streamline this process and now it's easier. Now you don't have like, Oh, you know, it, today is the annual report date for LLCs. And you're like, oh, I don't remember. Am I a corporation? Am I LLC? Like, we just, you just have one filing date going forward. And right. so, again, these are examples, very specific examples of the kind of changes that we've done at the Department of State to turn it into a very business-friendly space. Absolutely. Uh as business friendly as it is, and this is a this is a user error. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a slightly. It's funny, not not funny, haha, funny story. Unfortunately, I didn't realize until the, before this program when I was surfing the sites and and, and making sure I was up to date on what was going on uh, with your office. Um, I missed my filing last year, uh, and I got revoked. Yeah, uh, and I I, I didn't. Uh, if a, if a letter went out, I certainly didn't see it. But I will say, you know, to be fair, uh, last year between commerce applications and grants and loan applications and everything to try and recover from the pandemic, it's entirely possible that I missed it. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit, to me specifically, I want to know, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the, 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 uh, the being revoked and, and what does it mean to be registered with the state as an LLC or a C-Corp or anything like that? 
So basically, you know, historically, right, what is the Secretary of State? The Department of State, the Secretary of the State, literally is the Secretary of all of government. And so, you know, we have the, the State Archives, which has our historic documents. We've got the State Library, which, you know, assists the legislature. Uh, we've got the voter registration systems, right, which hold the database for elections, uh, you know, that we use uh, during the election season. And for business services, uh, or back in the old days when I was a deputy secretary of state, it was the corporations division. It was the registry of businesses incorporated in our state. Kind of was like a big filing cabinet, or the other way I would describe it is it was a, a, um, a phone book. Right. You kind of oh, yeah. you really needed to know what you were looking for and then you could find it. And, and so what we've tried to do is to make it more of a hub of information and to make it a lot easier for you to learn, not just about your own business, but about the state of business from the perspective of the of the secretary of state's office. It's not the end all and be all of the economy because we only have a snapshot into incorporations. So incorporations are that. Are, are the way that we we have a registry of any businesses that are doing, and it's really the larger businesses, the, the sole proprietorships do have the flexibility to actually register, right. you know, in the city or town. Although we do have a bill to try to bring that into uh, a statewide database as well, because we what we found is over time, the cities and towns don't have the wherewithal to keep those accurate. And so again, we already have the database program. We can keep it segregated. But, but, but provide that service to the cities and towns and, and, and to businesses, really, to make it easier. Yeah, that, that was actually one of the questions uh, one of our members asked is what, what as a sole prop, uh, sole proprietor, uh, can you register and, and things of that nature? So that's good to interest, good to hear that uh, you're interested in registering those businesses as well. Um, I found it interesting when I when I clicked this morning to see that I was revoked. That you know there was the reminder. You know you you are you know revoked and, and you know these possible penalties. But please don't forget to continue to pay your taxes on your business, which, which I thought was yeah. a, no. You know. Because what happens is people will forget, and sure. then yeah. years later, now you've got twelve hundred dollars instead of you know right. just hundred. And I want to say revoke. It's a very legal word. It right. sounds like you're a horrible human being. It's not. Like it, it happens to so many people, life is coming at us, particularly with the pandemic. Uh, and so you could be revoked as long, you know, as much as, you know, 10 years. Uh, and and okay. within those 10 years, actually normalize the filing, but you will have to pay the back taxes. And by taxes, we we also mean the uh, the, the, the uh, corporation's fee, uh, which is right. that $400, $400 fee that, that everybody pays annually, which I know business owners will tell me that it's, you know, not good for anything, but it does give you corporate identity, meaning it protects you and your assets, you know, within a business context. So, so you do actually get something for it, kind of like insurance, right? You do get, you have to pay for it. And, and this is one of the things that you do. Right. Yeah, no, I, I it did say, you know, I, you know, all the, the, the things that, you know, means to be revoked, but I just as easily can complete yeah. a form to get my letter of good standing and send it in and, you know, pay my $50 and get unrevoked. <laughs> and one of the things that we tried to make easier uh, for, uh, for that is, is that, um, that we made it a lot easier to get, get letters of good standing as well. This is something that we heard the small business coalition, uh, when I was first secretary of state and, and governor Raimondo had come in, uh, her tax office and my office worked very hard to streamline the process. Again, we passed another bill so that you wouldn't be required to get a letter of good standing from both agencies for a number of dissolution situations. We were really out of whack with the rest of New England. And yeah. I remember going to the tax administrator and saying, you realize that we ask for this like, you know, twice as many times more than, than other states in New England. And he's like, well, I've never looked at it that way. And I'm like, well, it's time to look at it that way. Let's streamline the process. And in, in and that has been a very successful implementation, again, to make this a much more business friendly state. So if you have any questions because you've looked it up yourself up on the business um, database uh, at sos.ri.gov and you want to figure out what to do next, feel free to call my office 222 3040. We have a call center. We're there to help you. It's, I know it seems scary. Like you're confessing to something that you've done wrong. It's okay. It happens to a lot of people. Yeah. We'll get you back on track and yeah. get you back, back to where, you know, we want you to be doing your business. Right.
And there you go. Ben's put it up on the screen. There's 401 222 And the website is uh, sos.ri.gov. You know, it was fascinating. And, and, you know, as I said, I think the website is drastically, you know, dramatically improved. It's, it's, it's great to see. And the tax website has also been dramatically improved, the tax portal, which I know is unrelated to you. Unfortunately, the two didn't like I couldn't click for a letter of good standing on on the SOS website, but I could on the tax website. All right. Was, I'll, I'll you know. say it now. Once I'm governor, we're going to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that later. Let's let's stick with the office right now. We'll, we'll certainly get to that uh, because, yeah, it was just it was just one of those things like, oh, the websites don't talk. But, you know, uh, one of those minor, minor problems that we all kind of come to accept with, with the state government. But it doesn't have to be that way. And yeah. certainly, like I said, you've, you've dramatically improved the uh the business website. I mean, I'll say, you know, it's unrelated to small business here and everything, but clearly uh, over the last couple of years, it's definitely proven that the election website is so much better. Uh, fantastic, fantastic stuff. And for everything from registering to, to, you know, seeing the results. And for those of you out there who are interested in, in, in information about elections, it, that, although you can get to it through the SOS.ri.gov, we have a specific voter right. center, which is vote.ri.gov. You can see your ballot once it's ready. You can track your ballot if you do a mail ballot. You could find out where your polling places are. There's a lot of information about elections. Anything that you ever needed to know about voting, including even who represents you at the, you know, um, on uh, your uh, city and town, and, and especially the, your general assembly members, you can find that information at vote.ri.gov. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's 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 a great website. So I'm glad. Uh, there's glad you a mentioned question that. there um, in the chat about will pro sole proprietorship get that? I mean, I think they mean a revocation notice, and the answer is no. Um, that that they don't have the same process at the local level. Right, but so there's a bill currently uh, in 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 uh, in the general assembly to add sole proprietors to that database. Yes, but to run it separately. So, right. so, so it, yeah. And I, I encourage if somebody's interested in more information about that, um, Maureen Ewing, who is the amazing director of our business services division, can have a, a, a heart to heart conversation with you about what the bill means and what it doesn't. Great. Well, while we're on the topic of bills, uh, there were two that I saw in the news uh, last week or the week before I wanted to ask you about, mm -hmm. uh, both submitted by uh, Representative Greg Amore, who's Happens to be, we, we had him on the program a few months ago. Uh, we had a great conversation. I really enjoyed my conversation with Rep. Amore a lot. Uh, he's he's running for Secretary of State since since you have to uh, leave the office due to term limits. Uh, the Modernized Rhode Island's Uniform Limited Partnership Act, um, the U Uniform Partnership Act, uh, the two different bills in the House. Uh, what can you tell us about those? How, how, what are they working for? Yeah, no. So those bills are really about modernizing the underlying legal structure. Most. Um, most small businesses, it's this is really more for the attorneys out out there to uh, to have a comment. There, there's something called the universe, uh, the uniform uh, commercial law statutes, and what they do is that although states can individually have their own systems set up and legal structures, uh, what this uniform law commission does is to try to streamline and and systematize certain aspects of the law that every state has so that you don't have crazy differences between one state and the other. And so those are really very technical bills, in my opinion, that, that are more just to, it's almost like infrastructure, right? You drive through the roads, you don't really notice it unless you see a pothole kind of thing, right. but, but most people don't have to worry about it. And it's the same thing for small businesses. Makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, all right. So you mentioned it once. I wanted to kind of, you know, delineate between the two conversations. Uh, you know, we talked about the, the, the Department of State and, and your office regarding small businesses. But as everyone knows, 2022 is an election year. It's a busy year. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, we've had a lot of candidates on already. We're having a lot more candidates uh, coming up and you are running for for governor. I am. And I'm excited about the opportunity to do the kind of work that people have been so thrilled with at the Department of State to do that on a much bigger landscape. I mean, imagine if the rest of state government worked the way the Department of State does. That would be pretty cool. Uh, and, and I think that it, it's, it's about making government work for people, whether you're a small business owner or you're a voter or you're a teacher or, or you're you know, a, a, a contractor. It's just you know, making government easy to use, easy to access. That, you know, obviously music to all our small business owners ears. Uh, I, you know, I, I, 
obviously, you know, that's our focus. You know, this is the Small Business Coalition's forum. Uh, and I think a lot of times uh, people realize, I mean, you know, the coalition kind of formed around uh, Lieutenant, then Lieutenant Governor uh, McKee's uh, initiatives. Uh, and, you know, everyone kind of assumed once he became governor that that would still be his primary focus. And, and he's been good for small business. I'm not criticizing. But we, I think we have to remember, and, and, you know, the governor's role covers the whole state. And a lot more than just small business, you know, everything from, you know, plowing the roads for, for, for snowstorms, which, you know, sounds like a, a minor thing, but it's very important here in Rhode Island um, to, you know, to, to, you know, beach access and, and you know, housing and, and all sorts of things. Um, why don't you give us, you know, the quick uh, some speech? I, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to like bog us down too much, but, I, but I'd like you to yeah. have that chance to do that. Look, um, you know, I'm I'm running, um, and and I think you know you'll hear this from from many of us running. Uh, I'm running to make sure that our economy grows in a way that's equitable and just. And in my opinion, it, you know, that means that we need to focus on our existing businesses, our people within our state. Um, others may want to try to bring companies from the outside. I, it's not going to be my focus. I believe in Rhode Island small businesses. In fact, I think that we have businesses. That with a little bit more support and you know from government or or maybe streamlining of processes, could become regional, could become national or even international businesses. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity within our various sectors, and whether it be the blue economy, the marine trades, you know the the emerging uh, green economy of of the alternative energy stuff, the you know manufacturing, hospitality, and tourism. You know there. There are really fantastic sectors here, but but we need a government that's much more agile and 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 really streamlined. Um, I also believe that the way you get to that better economy is to focus on three very important areas. One is housing. Housing is foundational to you know having a, a, you know people who are better educated, people that are in better health even to climate change issues. I mean, people don't realize because if we focus on transit, but housing, how we heat our houses up here and everything really matters in terms of our impact uh, on, on climate change. So we have a fantastic home building industry here, but they're, 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 they're tied at the, you know, down because of all the barriers to building housing. And some of it is, yes, we have to subsidize very low income people to possibly afford, you know, rentals and things like that. But, but we also just need to streamline the process for building housing in our state. And that takes leadership. There's no policy that you really, you can implement without real leadership on housing issues. And I happen to have been executive director of Housing Works and I know how to get that done. So, you know, housing is of course, like I said, interconnected with education. And it's very important that we make sure that we invest in our people all the way from our earliest, you know, childhood days uh, to universal pre-K and K through 12. Um, you know, I want to make sure that we add to the constitution a, a constitutional amendment that values education that says that it is the right of every Rhode Islander to have access to a quality education because without that education in this kind of a technological society, we're just not going to be able to advance and to be able to deal with things. Now, there are still people who are going to need in the trades, even though those trades are getting also more technological. And so we need to be able to support that activity. Um, and then all of this is tied to climate change. Uh, we need to prepare workers for that new economy. Uh, and, and I want to make sure that by the time we end up, you know, deploying this alternative energy economy, we don't, we don't 30 years, 40 years down the line go, oh my gosh, this is not a very diverse sector. We do, where are the women? Where are the people of color? Where are the immigrants? No, we need to build that into this recipe right now. So, you know, to me, those are three areas where, you know, we absolutely have to focus on in order to get to that economy. But at the heart of all of it are small businesses. And, and I'm excited about, you know, being able to tell Rhode Islanders, you know, if you like what you saw at the Department of State, believe me, you're going to love what you see when I'm governor. Um, you know, that ease of use of the websites, you know, people don't realize this, but when we released that website, we had the shutdown three days later. Now we had been improving things from the year that I started, streamlining uh, forms, making sure that they were on, on a, attractive websites that were easy to understand. Right. We invested in our state workers. So by the time you got to the new website edition, you know, three days before the pandemic shutdown, 
we made it easy for people to do their business. And so in 2020, we got a record number of business incorporations, record number, even though the office was closed to the public, you know, in, in terms of visits, that record was broken in 2021. So we've seen over 29,000 new business incorporations start in our state. And by the way, they're staying open too. 97% yeah. of those businesses are still active. So that's the kind of, that's what happens when you make it easier for businesses to do what they need to do with government. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's certainly been the focus of our coalition. It's certainly been fascinating to see. Uh, and, and, you know, there's because of the pandemic and, you know, if you, if you out tap to find silver linings where you can a lot of people started small businesses a lot of people unfortunately lost their jobs or you know decided they needed to change career so they, they took on that task of starting a small business uh so that's that's great to hear the, the numbers uh from you uh you know it's also fascinating to, to listen to, to the, the, the to the uh sections that you just talked about i think people also should remember a lot of the housing contractors out there are small businesses yep. uh yeah there's big corporations that, that build housing as well but you know there's a lot of contractors, small business contractors, uh, employing, you know, just a few people here and there and bringing together more of them. There's more, more housing needs. So that's a, that's an important part of the, uh, the industry, I think, uh, or the sector, I guess, if we lump all small business into one sector, I think it's also interesting to note, you know, I've talked to people who've started, uh, solar franchises, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are all small businesses again. And, and I think, you know, myself coming from the, the food and beverage area, Obviously, there's a million small businesses there. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned the blue economy, uh, marine uh, fishing, fishing people are small businesses, uh, you know, boat owners, things of that nature that do charters as small businesses. So there's a lot of spread across all these different sectors. Uh, so it's interesting to hear you, you talk about all those things. And, and then and, and then, you know, I, I just wanted to mention, I, I always say this to people, I say it kind of half jokingly, but 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 I'm serious in many ways. Uh, one of the reasons I can run a successful small business and, and have a, a nice home and a family and all that is uh, my wife's a school teacher. <laughs> I'm just gonna be honest, healthcare, uh, yeah. you know, all those things that come along with uh, with someone like that, uh, in that type of position. So uh, education is obviously extremely important to me as well. But I think I think if anyone thinks about it, if anyone thinks about the employees that you're getting, you mm -hmm. know, when they come out of high school or, or college or whatever it is that you're, you're hiring just small businesses because of a good education system. So uh, I think that's a that's a key point. I want I want people to remember. And this and this and, and this pandemic coming out of this pandemic means that we have an opportunity to change the way we've been doing things because the pandemic really showed us gross inequities that have always been there, but we've never really done anything with them. And we didn't have the funding, perhaps, to address some of them. Now we have all of these federal dollars coming into the state. Sadly, only 10% of them have been actually deployed, which right. you know, I will work on that very diligently and very differently than, than the current administration. But, but this is the opportunity to do, the, do things differently. And so if you wanna see how I spend federal monies, you could see the $9 million over the last seven and a half years on election reform. And you see a system that's completely been modernized and that is now a leader in, in the country in terms of election administration. I'm very proud of that. Um, you know, what are the odds that somebody who actually studied you know, public administration, public policy might actually know how to make government work? Um, I'm just saying, you know, maybe it's time to give one of us a chance um, because we know how to make, you know, the different levers of government, you know, work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as long as you can steer away from the bureaucracy side of it. No. I'm, I'm all for that. I, I get. Yeah. I, I have that same conversation with Liz Tanner sometimes because it's yeah. like you know she doesn't want the bureaucracy either. Uh, but but it's but you know obviously it's a it's kind of unfortunately baked into government in many ways. Yeah. Well, and there, and it's there for some good reasons. I mean, some regulation does help even yes. in the field. Um, we don't want to go into restaurants that are unsafe. We don't want to um, you know go into waters that have been polluted. Right. We've come a long ways as a society. The question is, though, how can we make it so that we use, for example, technology? We invest in in our work workforce, actually, in the public sector, which we actually tend not to do. I know it sounds kind of crazy, particularly for private sector people, but we don't do a lot of training of our public sector employees. That's the, been the difference in the Department of State uh, and in doing things differently. And and in the end, you know, we we're here to work for you. You are the customer. Um, and, and, and I'm excited about the possibility to have a, a real impact on so many people's lives 
by making sure that our resources in government are, are held accountable, uh, that the processes are transparent, like I've had them be over the last seven and a half years, uh, and that we can grow our state uh, together. Well, I mean, I, I like hearing you say, obviously, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a good thing to say, you know, that you, you work for us. But I think it's it's uh, it's interesting not, not, not to say it wasn't the attitude for many years, but it just kind of it didn't feel like it was in, in many ways. And it's definitely shifted and not. And, you know, I, I'm glad you said it, but I've, I've heard it from other division heads as well, department heads as well, that, you know, they get that, that, you know, that they're, they're they're beholden to the, the, you know, the citizens of the state in some ways. Um, so one of the things you brought up I wanted to ask you was on, on my list of questions here. What do you think about the ARPA funds? What, what, what's your uh, what, what, what's your overarching goal there and, and how do you see it happening so far? And because it's certainly something we've you know, we've tried to get out there. We've tried to push more funds uh, towards small business, obviously. And I'm not saying there aren't a million other things in the state that need to be addressed as well. So, you know, I'm not not naive to it. But obviously we look at it from the small business perspective. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, so first of all, let me just say that, you know, I know there were some hiccups in the loan programs at the very beginning, you know, the grant programs at the very beginning. I think from what I've talked to small business owners, those were smoothed out, uh, you know, as, as things got progressed. Um, we're now, I think, at the stage of post-pandemic that, that really what benefits small businesses is for us to invest it into infrastructure, into making sure that, um, that we are, and by infrastructure, I don't mean just roads and bridges, I mean our right. education system. Our education system is infrastructure. Um, that, that, yeah, know, I mean, it, it was, like I said before, you know, those kids are your employees one day. I mean, that's, so, that's infrastructure. Yeah. Um, that we use a significant portion of it to solve, to help address, uh, and solve the, the housing crisis that we're facing right now, which is crippling so many people in our state. Um, and so, uh, those are some of the areas and then some of them are going to be, um, areas that, you know, for example, I, I was very happy to see the Rhode Island Foundation talk about the importance of cyber. We yep. need to make sure that we're not at a technological disadvantage with other states by making sure that we have a robust access to the internet, to cyber, and to that it is a secure pro uh, process. I now have a security clearance, thanks to elections, on uh, cyber stuff and, and elections. And I can tell you that whether or not you have access to broadband is going to affect you as a business. Oh, yeah. Sure. But as a person, it will affect whether your kids or not can do their homework or not. It's going to affect what kind of health care you can get because telehealth is here to stay. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that those areas of government that are not maybe the sexy ones, um, you know, that there's not a lot of easy ribbon cuttings for that those areas of infrastructure and government happen at this moment in space and time, because we will never have this kind of funding to address housing, education, and infrastructure uh, in, in a fundamentally different way. Uh, and so that's where I, I see a lot of the dollars. And I think that those are the kinds of things that help create a good small business climate. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating you mentioned broadband. Uh, we have a lot of members of the coalition that are, are, are in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, telehealth has been, you know, it's interesting. I mean, even if I, you know, used to just call the office and make an appointment and wait and, you know, that sort of thing. Now I just can, you know, can call the office and that day I'll get a, a call back, which is, you know, either uh, on the on the computer or on my phone. Uh, that is a, essentially a doctor visit. Um, my, my insurance company bills me for it. <laughs> but, well, uh, if you're, but if you couldn't get through the video. Right. That's my point. Yeah, exactly. It, it's extremely crucial. So, yeah. So that's that's a challenge. But I mean, you know, the inequity again, I, and I don't mean to go too far down that path because it's not, not a small business issue. But but again, I, I think it goes back to what I was saying about, you know, educating our youth so they become good employees. If, if they don't have the broadband access, if, if you know, you know, God forbid there's another pandemic and, and, and students have to stay home. I, I can't imagine uh, students that don't have proper access like my, my kids, you know, fortunate enough to have. Yeah. No, yeah, none of us who had kids in school during the pandemic ever want to go. Like, I have to say, debt of gratitude, huge debt of gratitude to those educators, like your wife, who stuck through and, and did amazing work um, under absolutely horrific circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, was, um, yeah. So please give her a hug for me. <laughs> I certainly will. Yeah, she. I mean, I, I've told, I've said this before. She worked, you know, eight a.m. till midnight almost <laughs> every, you know, five days a week, and sometimes on the weekends. And not, she was alone. All her fellow teachers were doing the same. So it, 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 
it really yeah. was amazing to yeah. see. It gave us the opportunity to really stretch our, you know, our muscle in, 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 in government. So for example, we started developing a really cool online state house tour. Right. Yes. I remember that. Well, you actually, you actually were on a zoom at one point with one of my, uh, I think it was my oldest. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I popped through the, you know, I heard your voice and I was like, is Bridget talking to the secretary of state? And uh, yeah. So it was, it was great to see you do things like that. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was good. And, and by the way, I want to say that what I love about my office is, you know, the people doing this work are your state employees, right? You know, if the people I want this, I do it for the small business owners. If you love the way my office works, I just want you to know that that was done with 15, 20, 30 year state employees, all members of a labor union. Okay. What's different is the approach and the leadership. And so I, I, that's why I'm so excited about this next possibility, because I do believe that we can do things very, very differently. And, and, it, and brighter days are definitely ahead. Oh, very interesting to hear. Um, and and you know, regarding the state house tours, again, I think that harkens back to uh, small business with tourism, mm -hmm. uh, hospitality. A lot of people uh, come to Rhode Island uh, yes. as a tourist because of the history. And to have those uh, access yeah. at the state house are really, really neat. And I want to complement that and really anchor that historic tourism with an actual state museum, state history museum, state archives facility across from the state house, actually. Well, sort of diagonal from the, from the state house. That's an idea that I had a few years, well, pre-pandemic, and then things got derailed. But I'm very committed to having that happen because we need that anchor space that speaks to our story, that gives a, a space to tell our story, and then points to other places where you can continue to navigate the story. Um, whether it's, you know, you're interested in military history and you want to go to Newport to the beginning of the Navy, or, or it's, you know, Nathaniel Green's house in Coventry or right. the Jim Brown house, right? Uh, if you want to, you know, look at religious freedom, again, Newport's a fantastic place to go. Um, or to learn about, you know, our role in the state slave trade and, and the resources over in Bristol. So there's a lot there that we could be building on. Uh, there's no reason why, you know, the, our neighbors to the north have to eat our lunch on this. Yeah. We just, we just need to really make sure that, that we correct people's history books. You know, the, the Gatsby is the spark that ignited the American Revolution. And yeah. if you want more on that, you can go to sos.ri.gov, where we have created a very robust uh, online exhibit, uh, as well as it complements our, our existing exhibit at the State Archives, uh, just to make sure people know. Yeah, and, and very timely. This is Gatsby Days. Uh, your small businesses in Patuxent Village would love to see you. Uh, I work with a lot of them there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there's a lot of big issues that, uh, you know, will be addressed as governor. So I'm going to just throw a few of them at you and, and give us, you know, your thoughts. Uh, let's start with... Uh, uh, the uh, recreational marijuana, uh, it looks like it's going to pass. You just mentioned, you know, res our, our, our friends to the north e eating our lunch on uh, on historical travel. Well, they're certainly eating our lunch on recreational marijuana. W what are your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, look, um, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that as a mom, I'm worried about it. But, you know, it is here. It is around us. It has been legalized. It's time for us to to move forward with that. And then to, to do two things, to make sure that the money is targeted in part towards addiction services uh, for those that, that might end up uh, on that path, sadly. Um, and, and then the other piece of it is, is that there, there has to be, and I believe the, the bills do address expungement of records for, for past offenders, uh, because what's fair is fair. It goes to yeah. issues of equity. And so, you know, I, you know I'll, I'll manage it with all due caution as, as we go forward. Absolutely. Uh, your thoughts on the? Uh, it looks like it's it's going through uh, smoothly so far. But your thoughts on the uh, the industrial trust building and, and the uh, the the deal that's been worked out there? It's a it's a large sum of money from the state. It is. It is. Um, you know, I'm still waiting to see how it, it it goes through. You know, with regards to to the local. Um, you know, I have some concerns. I have some concerns about the the wealth of of, of resources that's going to be invested in it. Um, yes, it's a great building. It's a fine architectural gem. It was created for a purpose as, you know, it, it, because architecture comes with a purpose. Um, and so it's very costly, uh, what we're talking about. Um, I'd, I'd feel better about it if it wasn't so costly. Uh, because yeah. I think about 
you know, I know that it's supposed to have this ripple effect on the economy, but you know what would have an amazing impact on our economy? Making sure that that kind of money gets spent on Providence Public Schools and the infrastructure of education in our capital city. If our educational system in Providence were upgraded significantly, uh, we would not have a problem filling commercial real estate or any other kind of real estate uh, because there would be a huge demand. And I think that there is a connection. And, and this is the thing about public policy. Things are interconnected. Yeah. One solution needs to be able to address more than just one problem in order for it to really leverage our tax dollars. And so, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, another topic that's often brought up with small businesses, especially those in the coastal communities, uh, there's lots of small businesses that take advantage of the coast, is obviously uh, climate change and sea level rise. What, what, what uh, well, you touched on a little bit before, but let's talk specifically to, uh, you know, affecting businesses in those areas that, that, you know, have been flooded before, things of that nature. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we need to start addressing this front and center. The town of Warren has done a great job in starting to identify what are we going to do because the water's coming and there's no stopping it, right? So uh, we need to have more of those conversations around our coastal cities and towns. We are amazingly blessed in having an institution like the University of Rhode Island that has a ton of academic resources that can help the cities and towns through this, navigate all of this. And so, um, yeah, no, I will be definitely focusing some of my efforts out of the governor's office to look proactively at, uh, at, at what we need to do to secure, you know, our coastlines in, 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 in a more feasible way. All right. Uh, I don't want to forget, uh, Ben, are there any questions in the Facebook chat uh, for the secretary? There we go. One there on screen, uh, expressing great points. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on how you would address the affordable housing crises? Oh, sure. I, that's my, one of my favorite topics, actually. Uh, only because I was executive director of Housing Works. Right. right. Yeah. Ended up being a coalition of businesses, uh, a nonprofit affordable housing developers, and others in the community that wanted to address this. And and so, thanks to my work um, uh, in that coalition, we were able to get our second housing bond, implement the first two housing bonds, create two thousand uh, homes uh, with those monies, and and show that really we can do this. Um, so. So I will be looking at, uh, and, I, and I see that Speaker Shikarchi has already moved forward with it, but the Secretary of Housing and Community Development really should be uh, a cabinet level position for the governor. I don't believe that it belongs in the commerce RI uh, uh, basket uh, because, it, because it really needs to complement with human services for some, for some part of the, of the housing uh, that we're going to be providing, it needs to be complemented by wraparound services. And so that coordination and orchestration happens best out of the governor's office. It also says this is a real issue that the governor is going to really marshal uh, when you have a, a position like that. So we're going to be doing so that I'm going to very proactively be working with cities and towns. We cannot fund or subsidize our way out of the housing crisis. Right. Yeah. Not enough money. Um, we need to subsidize the very, very lowest you know, housing for the unhoused, people like that. But but we need senior housing for seniors to leave their multi, you know, bedroom home and, and downsize. We need affordable family housing for starter homes. And what's happened is, is that over time, over the last 20 years, we have gone to, to be in this locality that makes it so difficult to build anything that, that a developer, even though like a city or town may have a plan for housing, when they go to present to the town, it's now three years and a lot of legal expenses in order to build the housing. And so that makes it seem very unfriendly. Yeah. We have a perfect storm. We've got, we haven't been building enough housing. We've only been building about a thousand units uh, of housing per year. We should be more like three or 5,000 per year. We have the Airbnb situation, which, is, which has grown exponentially and taken rentals off the market. And then we have the fact that during the pandemic, some people in other states discovered that Rhode Island's a really nice place to Zoom commute from. Sure. Well, those three uh, forces are, are limiting the amount of housing that's available to just regular working folks. And people, we're not going to have an economy if regular folks, working folks, ha don't have a place to live. So I am going to be working with the cities and towns and, and using some of the federal dollars at my disposal 
to, again, attack more than one issue at the same time. So sometimes municipalities will say, oh, we'd love to have more dense housing in this place, but it's an infrastructure issue. We don't have the right infrastructure. Okay, yeah. we have infrastructure dollars. Let's apply those in addition. Um, oh, well, we need to address educational needs if we're going to have more family housing. Okay, let's talk about how we revise your funding formula or special grant program so that you take away the, the objections that people put uh, to, to the building of housing. And so there's no silver bullet out there for any of these problems. Right. It's having the leadership skills, having the experience, having that, that ability to move people to wheel and cajole others into possibly doing, you know, what really is the right thing for the, for the bulk of us. So, um, that's, that's what I've been doing as secretary. I mean, if you look at our election in 2020 during a pandemic, like a crazy election, you know, in terms yeah. of candidacies, right? Uh, I already knew that the election was going to be tough. I'm the chief state election official, so there's a lot of weight on my shoulders about it. But I don't work alone on elections. I work on it with the Board of Elections, which is a separate agency, and the local boards of canvassers. So we had already been investing every single year from the time I became Secretary of State to improve our elections. When it came to the pandemic, we thought, oh, shoot, that's going to be a slog. But okay, we can handle it because we had been investing in our infrastructure of government. And so, you know, with early in-person voting passed, we were able to get people to vote in record numbers. The 2020 election saw the largest number of voters ever in the history of Rhode Island. And every voted, everyone voted safely and securely. Yeah. Whether it was by mail, early in person, or uh, on election day. And I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that, you know, everywhere I went, people were thankful and grateful for that opportunity versus what happened in other places. And it was, it was a little bit crazy sometimes when, when I talked to some of my secretary of states in other states and they're <laughs> to, like under police escort. And I'm like, no, I, I get told how much people love me at the supermarket. But yeah, I can't imagine. I, I, you know, and I, and I hopefully I'd love to, you know, I, Hopefully that passes that everything, all those things that you did, uh, all those things you just mentioned become permanent because it was. So Absolutely. Yeah. That's why that's yeah. why it's important to have the Let Rhode Island Vote Act passed because those were really good measures. A lot of them are already in place. Right. So finalize some of them to finish it off. And and but to, that goes to the kind of, of, of learning and, and work that I've done as Secretary of State that really gets me ready for this next uh, ne next uh, step of, of, of being governor. Uh, it's not something that you just want to learn on the job. You have to know how to do it um, and, and know how to move things in government, which is very different than in other sectors. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, as I as I said to, to uh, our, our our board's members yesterday, I knew this was going to go long. I knew I would enjoy talking with you. And we, were just, we were just talking, talk, talk. So I've taken up a lot of your time and we have gone a bit over. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, good luck with the campaign. Uh, and thank you for everything you've done as Secretary of State. Uh, we appreciate having you. No, thank you. Thank you to the coalition for advocating. I'm, I'm always about getting people engaged with their government. That's how we change things. Thank you, David, for all the work you've done in the hospitality uh, sector to really highlight how wonderful uh, a state we have. And I look forward to working with you some more over the next few years. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, so yeah, that was a, that was a great conversation. I, I hope you uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, as always, this is uh, you know saved on Facebook. If you if you missed the beginning, you can come back and watch watch the rest of it. We've got a great group of uh, guests coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, going back to the General Assembly before the session closes for Senator Jessica De La Cruz and Representative Karen Alzate, you know the next two guests. But then we've got some candidates coming up. We've got Treasurer Seth Magaziner coming up. He's running for Congress. Uh, Joy Fox also running for Congress. Uh, they're June eighth and July twelfth. Uh, Ashley. Ashley Kalis, uh, I hope I'm saying that right. I haven't actually heard it out loud now that I say it, but I hope I said that right. She's running for governor and she'll be with us August 9th. And then we've also got some more small business owners and small business uh, support groups coming up in the uh, next few months during the summer. So please join us for all those shows and more at rismallbusiness.org. You can join the coalition. Uh, it's only getting bigger and better every every day. Uh, seriously, I'm, I'm not just saying that for hyperbole. It really is. Hit rismallbusiness.org and sign up the newsletter and you'll find out everything that's going on and I'll see you at the next show. Thank you.